welcome. Uh, there's the Q&A uh, apparatus on your Zoom screen and you can post your questions. For those of you here, you can just raise your hand. I'm delighted and honored to introduce Cynthia Hahn from Hunter College, whose paper is entitled The Brooch Upon the Chest, Lodester and Amulet. Yeah, all right. Welcome, Cynthia. Yeah, sorry, I have a cold, so we'll see how gravelly my voice gets as we go on, hoping to, uh, to last through the whole thing. It's really nice to be here. I'm finding this material just wonderful because I personally am engaged in writing a very broad book on jewelry for the Middle Ages, and this work comes from that, uh, but with some extra, <laughs> with extra. This won't all be in the book. Okay. In the making and wearing of brooches, the desire for significance prevails. Not only are these pins, fibula, brooches, necessary objects for holding the cloak closed, but they are literally significant objects, carrying meaning in their forms and materials, as well as being in every sense multifunctional. I lightheartedly compare them. What happened there? Okay. Um, to a mini tool today, which didn't turn up in the PowerPoint somehow. I will begin today with general qualities of medieval brooches, then move to specifically early medieval examples, and finally conclude with an example that pushes the possibilities of the intimacy of the form, the Anglo-Saxon fuller brooch. Not loud enough? Okay, is that loud enough? Are we hearing? I don't think I can really project very well with my voice the way it is, but if it's not loud enough, please wave your arms around. <laughs> Um, many medieval brooches are overlaid with the image of the cross. However, many also take advantage of the simplest shape of the brooch, the circle, or approximately circular enclosure, in order to exploit additional metaphorical significance. These shapes... What? Am I doing the wrong thing here? Okay. <laughs> Guess I was. Um, these shapes activate a range of meanings generated by the circle, from ideas of inclusion to focus from time to cosmos, more specific references to the body, the stars, and to animals and vegetation of the natural world all play a part in expanding such meanings and pinpointing attention on the breast of the wearer who wears his or her brooch and what one might call a shield over the heart. I specifically use the word shield because of one additional use, that is the brooch is in essence, almost always amuletic, as I will argue today. Of course, in addition to the more symbolic meanings of the brooch, its practical aspects immediately calls attention to general issues of protection and safekeeping. Variants of the name occur in inventories, nush, ush, brosh, vermaculum, and variants of use real, reveal that in the later Middle Ages, brooches might be used to attach rather than close perhaps affixing one's paternoster, pendant, or badge to the bodice or belt. Comments on their use range from general protection, as in a 13th century inscription on a brooch from Essex, I am the brooch to guard the breast that no knave may put his hand on it. And other earlier examples seem to consider the brooch a marital gift and protection. In 1184, the poet Johannes de Oville wrote, my bride shall wear a brooch, a witness to her modesty and a proof that hers will be a chaste bed. It will shut up her breast and thrust back any intruder, preventing its closed approach from gaping open, even stopping the adulterous eye. A 13th century poet claims that this is the reason brooches were invented. Well, he's wrong, but it's clear, <laughs> clearly not the case. Brooches, it can be said, were the medieval safety pin serving a wide range of users as devices to close or to secure as well as to protect. They were worn as often by men as by women and could even serve on the shoulder as military ranks of insignia, insignia of rank, excuse me, or could take the form of the Episcopal Morse or other clasp like adornments, reliquaries, or here perhaps this is a Agnes Day, worn in the chest of an ecclesiastic or devotee. 
It is often very difficult to ascertain whether a brooch was meant for a man or a woman. And to complicate matters, such objects were often gifts and served as votives even to the churches where they might be repurposed for ceremonial wear. To shift our focus to early medieval examples from the sixth to 11th century, again, the circular shape dominates the form of the ring or annular brooches. Alternatively, the disc brooch properly popular from the sixth century, um, circles constitute a simple but evocative shape. Examples often overlay multiple crosses, double them, which quarter the shape, pushing the result towards an evocation of the cosmos, an association already resident in symbolism of the cross itself, whose four arms stretch to the four corners of the world. Additional stepped ornament and animal imagery, including snakes, boars, and eagles can have many interpretations. Although again, cosmic aspects are often suggested. In one of these examples, the shapes are grouped as threes instead of fours, which I find fascinating. The eagle may be Odin or a representation of virility and farsightedness. The interlace often seems to represent plant growth and or cosmic order. Materials on the brooches also have meaning from the prestige of gold to the shining of garnets, to the white purity of shell. As in the case of the animals, the materials connect the brooch to the wider meanings and powers of the world. The Anglo-Saxon fuller brooch from the British Museum is a very fine disc brooch of shining silver with yellow details and an exemplary object to consider more closely, but is also typical of its charm in most of its features. Some suggest it was worn by Alfred the Great himself, who died in 899, or at least in his court. Alfred was not only literate, but also a king whose learned texts discussed sight and the mind's eye. And as the principal way in which wisdom was acquired, the unique early medieval depiction here of sight as one of the five senses has long been understood to be the subject of the brooch. The central figure has emphatic staring eyes as if sight itself. <laughs> well, this was the first day, and this is my, uh, a little baby special in my life. And she, this is the first day she really opened her eyes and it was like she was staring at everything with wonder. And it just seemed so perfect for this. Anyway, sorry. As if it's a means of wondrous discovery. Um, the, the figure to the upper left, puts his hand in his mouth, suggesting the sense of taste. On the lower right, a figure puts his hands together to represent touch. On the lower left, the figure seems to bring his hand to his ear to signify hearing or perhaps a call to action. And finally, the figure on the upper right puts his hand behind his back and represents with his profile nose, the sense of smell. Depicted around the figures is lush vegetation and a repeated three-pointed knot motif that has been associated with Trinitarian symbolism. But as many commentators note, the Anglo-Saxons had a love of riddles and puzzles and the meaning of the brooch does not end with our first observations. Around the five senses is a beautifully pierced ring with roundels. The piercing suggests to me in this as well as many other brooches that we should look metaphorically beyond the surface, perhaps into the body that it lies upon, but also in this case, we should look into the night sky. Beads de natura rerum, the authority for Anglo-Saxon knowledge of the heavens via Pliny and Isidore, emphasizes again and again the circularity and spherical shape of the cosmos and notes the simultaneous creation of the angels along with the earth. In the outermost ring, there are 16 roundels can, uh, containing four figures, two at the top and two at the bottom with wing-like elements sprouting near their shoulders and with covered hands. Now I'm comparing him to an angel from a manuscript that's contemporaneous. I would suggest that these are angels and that the other 12 elements of the ring might represent the 12 zones of the zodiac. I know that seems strange, but Bede is markedly adverse to mythological characters, dismissing them as representations of pagan fables. Alternatively, we might see, be seeing the four corners of the earth each with three elements, plants, four-legged beasts, and birds. Most significantly, Beads begin, begins his book by discussing the fourfold nature of God's creation. 
in his treatise, he presents a multiple of fours, a multitude of fours, the four directions, the four seasons, the four elements of air, wa earth, water, and fire, and the four humors of the body. But he begins in his first sentence with a statement about the fourfold work of God or divine power. And this diverging from his um, classical sources and from Isidore. He describes the creative fourness in this way. Number one, the verbum dei, that is the eternal logos or plan of creation. Number two, the simultaneous creation of unformed matter, materia informa, informi, excuse me. The creation of heaven and earth over three days is number three, that is creation in time. And number four are the seeds and primordial clauses that perpetuate God's work of creation. On the brooch, the figures and animals are surrounded with vegetation and interact with it. And recent scholarship, <clears throat> Itai, has linked materia, especially unformed matter, to silva, that is to foliate decoration and the ideas of organic growth and change. Anglo-Saxon scribes copied Bede's text along with Isidore's De Partibus Mundi and included a series of circular diagrams in Walter's manuscript 73, one of which explicates the interrelation of the four elements, the four bodily humors and the four seasons. And in the central um, medallion, we see anus or year. Bede explains that the cross shape created by the arcs expresses Christ's role in restoring to nature its original harmony, order, and meaning believed to have been disrupted by the fall of man. So the fuller brooch is clearly similarly demarcated into four zones. And in this is typical of Anglo-Saxon brooches and has a key central figure. However, that figure is not Christ or the year, although he or she is marked with a small cross and is inscribed within a cross shape and thus clearly delineated as Christian. A similarly frontal figure holding two scepters or fronds or flails appears on other objects such as the famous Anglo-Saxon Alfred Jewell. And these figures have been linked, both of these figures have been said to represent sight as already noted, but moreover, they've been linked to the quote, cosmic order of creation. If then we can imagine the fuller brooch as a depiction of cosmic order and the cycle of time, it is one that ultimately also makes a correlation to the human body and its care, the humors. In sum, it seems like the fuller brooch is, as typical, as I argue, an amulet, an object that protects the health and well being of the wearer by means of bodily as well as cosmic balance and order, albeit in this case, excuse me, the result takes a more intellectually complex approach than money amulets. Men, and many of its sister brooches just take the forms of the cross and the circle to convey what I would argue is the same idea. In exploring such amuletic functions, however, I am drawn to a later 11th or 12th century Syriac cloisonné brooch from the Louvre. A similar forward staring face, this one with long blue hair, is surrounded also with interlace, but now they are snakes. And in fact, this is the head of Medusa. That is a common use of the Gorgon as apotropaic, as well as a metaphor of the power and danger of sight. The inscriptions on front and back of this object include both cosmic and very specifically protective elements. On the front, it reads, holy, 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 the Lord God, the heavens and the earth are full of thy glory. That is the Trisagion or chant of the angels heard at the beginning of the mass. And on the back, a multi-line inscription that is hard to read, but some parts are legible and surely repeat the description of the uterus um, in magical formularies, coiling like a serpent, hissing like a dragon and roaring like a lion, admonishing it to lie down like a lamb. <clears throat> and objects from so far afield seems an unlikely comparison to an Anglo-Saxon brooch perhaps, but the British Isles were cosmopolitan in this era. Um, Alfred himself traveled a great deal and had surprisingly vital connections to other cultures. Furthermore, the comparison is compelling in that it reiterates the linking of the diverse concepts of sight, the order of heaven and earth, and bodily protection. If nothing else, we learn from these examples that amulets are not simple objects that do a bit of magic. These are things that invoke natural magic and link together the powers of liturgy, cosmic knowledge, the senses, and time. They also function as shields. And with the central gorgon, 
fend off dangerous sight, whether with this pagan Medusa or Christianized sight. Brooches, if we look closely or sometimes look through, have surprising force and commonality of meaning. Western brooches also use the head of Medusa and other, all other kinds of jewelry for protection. And one seventh century Frankish brooch of great beauty even uses or rather reuses a bright coral cameo to add material power to the iconic power of Medusa's gaze. Other materials, garnet, shells, pearls, and gems have curative and powers, and, but I don't have time to go into those. But red coral stands out among them. At the simplest material level, it is protective, but also potentially medicinal. In his natural history, Pliny gives the name of coral as coralium, derived from Greek, but related, <clears throat> excuse me. but related to the Latin word curare. He suggests that it might be powder and compounded to cure digestive problems, to soothe eye problems and ulcers, to efface scars and to lower fever. He claims that it is resistant to fire. Its origin story, however, is even more compelling. In the Metamorphosis, Ovid tells us that the coral of the Red Sea was formed when the blood of Medusa spilled on to seaweed. The fresh plants, all still living inside and absorbent, respond to the influence of the gorgon's head and harden at its touch, acquiring a new rigidity in its branches and fronds. Even now, corals have the same nature, hardening at a touch of air, and what was alive under the water, above water, is turned to stone. We know coral doesn't work that way, but that's what they thought. So just as Medusa's head could turn those who looked at her to stone, her blood changed the very nature of coral. In Christian understanding, this ability to transform, indeed coral's quality as simultaneously both plant and stone, is associated with Christ's dual nature as both human and divine, and also with his blood, which had unlimited power. Of course, coral is also red, or in this case, bright coral colored. It fends off demons and has always been considered potent against the evil eye. Able to change its nature and that of others as a general curative and powerful defense, coral is only one of the efficacious materials used by devout Christians. And once again, the Molsheim brooch centers the powers of sight, Medusa. Its cosmic design has been noted by Madeline Cavanis in a discussion, and it adds to these meanings the powers of material. One, of course, could argue for the power of silver as a material as well, I wanted to go into that at length, especially its value after refinement and fire. Another silver and yellow brooch from England, later 10th or 11th century, very large, but not as good as the fuller brooch, preserves, however, an inscription for us. Edwin owns me and may the Lord own her. May the Lord curse him who takes me from her unless she gives me of her own free will. I love this inscription. The abstract animal decoration is a little monstrous, but the field is again divided into fours and the outer ring into 12. The language of the inscription can be compared to wills. And the brooch was found with about a hundred silver coins, gold rings, and a silver dish. Clearly an object of importance and value. It is both identified, however, as personal, but also perceived value as gift, potential, heritage object, but perhaps this is one that shows a less complex version of care of the body. Still, it is situated in cosmos and time. And again, the cosmic and salvific nature of the cross was evident that such forms were used over and over again here at Contemporary Reliquary in the British Museum that is contemporary to this, this Anglo-Saxon material and a whole bunch of brooches and I could show you many more. <clears throat> so we have already referred to amulets and magic. But have, we have to discuss it a little more in a Christian environment. It's a complicated subject requiring further investigation. First of all, the use of amulets is representative, not of, only of Christian belief, but of a larger antique belief system endemic to Mediterranean society. Magic was important to Jews, to Muslims, to Christians, and indeed to any remaining pagans. Many of the magical formulae themselves are polyglot, written in Hebrew, Hebrew or Greek or in other mysterious marks, usually called character. 
and powerful accumulation, the more arcane symbols, the more ancient the reference, the more threads drawn together from different traditions, the more the result represents mighty signs. In much the same way, powerful materials were considered most active in accumulation when it comes to amulets. Gregory of Tours in the history of the Franks describes a magician with a large bag of roots of herbs, moles, teeth, mice, bones, and claws, and grease of bears. Archaeologists have discovered similar gatherings of animal teeth, iron rings, and pierced coins, and powerful stones, amber, amethyst, and rock crystal, as well as amuletic relic collections in early medieval graves. Early medieval Christian graves, I should say. From the early Christian period, a residential archaeological site such as Animorium shows that amulets and charms were very much part of everyday life. An early Christian necklace in Cleveland presents a beautiful gold chain upon which is suspended a gold cross and two hexagonal capsules, which may contain amulets. They haven't been opened. They may contain lamellae, that is thin sheets of metal, as I'm showing you here, written with charms, characters, names of power or holy texts and rolled up never to be read again, unless we open them and read them. <laughs> yeah. At any rate, there's also another charm on this necklace with a centrally pointed garnet, you can see the round one, simulating a crystalline structure, perhaps again representing protection against the evil eye. Jerome <clears throat> labeled amulets as pagan and many important commentators followed him, including Pope Galasius, St. Eligius, the English scholar Alcuin, etc. Augustine, however, gives us an answer to the legitimate persistence of amulets. He scorns them if they are believed to have their own intrinsic or magical power. However, he can accept them if they are understood to derive their power from God as part of his natural creation, and if the believer uses them in appropriate fashion. And this, of course, means prayer. Nevertheless, <clears throat> The belief in the evil eye and malevolent demons was ubiquitous throughout the Middle Ages, and as a result, families insisted on protecting children defined as defenseless and vulnerable to demonic attack with bells and amulets. And I love this one that I discovered at the British Museum. Um, one is 17th century, so these I just persist, but the other one is a, like a 9th century amulet too. Yeah, anyway. Viking, it's said to be. John Chrysostom in the fourth century already complained of these practices, arguing that mud, um, I'm sorry, they, people put mud on their forehead, children's foreheads to avert the evil eye. And John Chrysostom said that covered the mark on the forehead of the chrism given in baptism. And so one shouldn't do that. And only the cross should be tied around a child's neck. Across the Mediterranean, people nevertheless chose to try and protect themselves against demonic threats. Christian authorities were particularly concerned to deny the agency of materials, arguing that things had power only through divine intervention. The English abbot Elfric from the, um, died in 1010, tells a tale about a woman who, despairing of her doctor, was told by a Jewish man to heal herself. She was to take a wart from the back of an ox, bind it to a ring, and tie the bundle to her body. A lot of times these things are tied to the body in creative ways. On her way to the Christian shrine, however, the ring appeared on the path in front of her, all the knots still firm, but having fallen off her body. On her way to the Christian, um, I'm sorry, from this she understood that she should proceed without the charm, and then she was cured by Saint Stephen and God's grace. For Elfric, God clearly denied the power of the material charm made by the woman. Nevertheless, belief persisted that material objects, if manufactured with compelling formulae and charms by powerful human agents, including priests, then they had agency in themselves, a feature condemned again over and over again by the authorities. Again, he's saying that it was God who worked any miracle. So I'd like to return to the fuller brooch with its image of vision. Is this indeed akin to the Gorgon? Is it intended to be repellent of the evil eye? If it is, it is cloaked in beads, learned understanding of nature and vision, and surely white or natural magic. Once again, I argue that jewelry owners of the Middle Ages desired, even demanded the polyvalent, the powerful, that is material beauty, but also powerful agency of materials and manufacture. 
To sum up thus far, I have tried to establish some commonalities approaches. Many are discs worn in proximity to the heart. They play double duty, both protective and, and spiritually significant, even if only because of the presence of the cross. Many refer to cosmic issues and the care of the body. <clears throat> and indeed, in moving on to my third section, to the fuller brooch specifically, it is the relationship to the body and the potential use of the brooch that has not been examined sufficiently and that I think deserves further attention. But I haven't not noted how truly unusual the fuller brooch is. I've talked about its commonality. First, it's figural. There are almost no figures in other Anglo-Saxon art. Although silver, it is as fine as the surviving gold rings with inscriptions that name King Ethelwulf and Queen Ethelswith, that is Alfred's father and his sister. The suggestion that this was Alfred's brooch may not be an outlandish one. One might begin by asking, why the five senses? This is almost a unicum until much later in the Middle Ages. One numismicist has identified a series of coins with what she says are representations of the senses. And Leslie Webster identifies a strap that may, a strap end that may represent taste. Despite such attempts to normalize the iconography of the brooch, it is still uniquely compelling. Some scholars have argued that the central figure represents not corporeal vision, but interior sight and spiritual vision, that is wisdom. Surely sight here rules the senses, but in what manner? I would argue that vision is taking care that the body does not succumb to sin because of the temptation of the senses. If we look more closely at these wide staring eyes, we may not be seeing wonder and wisdom, but instead vigilance and care. And I'm comparing the large eyes and that wrinkled brow of, brow of concentration to figures of the Roman tetrarchs. In order to understand the senses more fully, at this moment in Anglo-Saxon history, we should turn first to Isidore of Seville, who emphasizes the active and receptive nature of senses and claims that in turn they activate the body. Isidore's emphasis on action is particularly relevant to the brooch. Look at hearing, um, who seems to hear a call and begin to run. Um, and in fact, all four senses have whole bodies. That's also almost unprecedented. We usually get bust figures for the census. Um, so they do seem to actually uh, look, at, look at taste jamming his fist in his mouth. I mean, these are very active figures. Um, but to understand the centrality of vision more clearly, we must look to the English scholar who made his name in Charlemagne's court, Alcuin of York, who writes in his De Ratione Animae, the soul manages the parts of the body, and it is appropriate for her to discern all these things with the rational vision of her mind, lest something inappropriate happen anywhere in the workings of her flesh. And as Catherine O'Keefe argues, Elfric of Ainsheim builds specifically on that idea, linking the fleshly members of the body to the senses, writing in Old English, and here translated, the soul is the mistress of the body and governs the five senses of our body as from a throne. We are getting a very vivid idea of a body activated by senses and of a fluid movement from inside to out, from outside to in. Indeed, O'Keefe further argues for particular somatic sensibility to spirituality in the Anglo-Saxon period and centrality of sight in this system. She remarks on the striking emphasis of the senses in the Old English translations sponsored by Alfred and concludes that, quote, the peculiar power of sight and thus its relative value was its perceived mediation between the corporal and the incorporeal. In his assessment of the underlying meanings and metaphors of Old English word usage, Javier Diaz Vera agrees with this importance of sight not only does he find a remarkable array of sight words and metaphors in the text he examines, but he draws this startling conclusion. Finding an important metaphor that no longer survives in modern English, he writes, similarly, restraining is seeing, protecting or defending is seeing, taking care that something be done is seeing. Perhaps one source of these ideas of the senses may come from the Anglo-Saxon's favorite father of the church, 
Pope Gregory the Great. He activates a striking metaphor in the morality and Job. He writes, seeing, hearing, tasting, smelling, and touching are a kind of a way of the mind by which it should come forth. For these senses of the body are like windows through which the soul takes a view of exterior objects. We're only too familiar with the metaphor of the eyes or the window of the soul. But here Gregory expresses a startling permeability with many windows between the inner and the outer senses. And that permeability was taken up by Anglo-Saxon writers, as we've seen. As a favorite source of wisdom for Alfred, we can read further in Gregory in his pastoral care, which Alfred had translated and um, very explicitly upon his order. He distributed it, in fact, to all the Anglo-Saxon bishops, copies of the pastoral care, and even other bishops outside his realm. <laughs> He was very keen on this text. Uh, in the following passages, the ruler should be understood as the bishop, but could also be Alfred himself. Again, a striking emphasis on vision and the regulation of the senses prevails in part to show that in order that a leader properly prevents sin, he must recognize it without fail. Gregory, in the words extensively enhanced by the English translator, writes, it is necessary that the eye of the ruler be not obscured by the dust of earthly cares. The head has to guide the feet. And it is necessary for the ruler to be zealously vigilant. He warns that the bleared eye misses inner brightness and celestial light and cautions, let not thine eyes sleep nor thy eyelids doze. And finally, those who are to rule others must direct their eyes both inside and outside the body. And the eyes are the teachers. This is a language again that focuses on corporeal eyes, but the moves in and out of the body with freedom to the inner eye as well. Looking again at the eyes of the central figure of the brooch, certainly the eyelids do not doze <laughs> and are indeed zealously vigilant, vigilant. But after detecting sin, the ruler must prevent entry into the body, either into the body of the sinner or into the body of the church. How might this be done? Surely through prayer, but also Gregory writes of potential actions. Quote, there must be a rod signifying that he is to correct his subjects and a sweetness of manna in his breast showing that he is be gentle with them. The ruler must use his inner judgment, his inner and outer eyes. I would argue that these ideas do not may remain abstract. Carol Farr has brilliantly argued that this page of the book of Carol's depicts it, we know it depicts the temptation of Christ, but she argues that it joins the body of Christ to the temple, that is the church, as well as the congregation of the church uh, as well, so that all are gathered here together at the same moment of the temptation. And then I quoted there a riddle uh, by an Anglo-Saxon writer, Tatwina in the Exeter book speaks of the five brothers with different names, that is the senses, constantly attending the temple granted to us from the beginning. So the body again is a temple. And I'm wanting to say that the Kells miniature has this little door at the bottom of the temple that people struggle to explain. And people often compare that little figure to Osiris, which I'm doing as well. He has his crossed implements, a hook and a flail. In fact, rulers implements to punish and protect. Whether this comparison is, has any real meaning because you know they're so different in time and place, there may be Coptic go-betweens, it's hard to say. But nonetheless, I cannot help but see parallels and imagine that sight is carrying not some floppy and de decorative vegetation in cornucopia, as some people say, but instead, I think these are flails on the brooch. Whipping for purification or punishment occurs frequently in the Bible, and the whip was a common attribute of medieval personification of grammar. We should remember that the Alfred Jewel with its figure of sight also holds two scepters, I showed below. And at this angle, you can see that these are more like flails than flowers. What finally drove the point home for me was the realization that in the true Hiddle Horde, a lavish group of silver objects and ornaments contemporary to the brooch, there is a silver flail. 
just over 22 inches, currently attached to a hard stone bead. It is not a large and threatening object, but instead an elegant reification of diligent self-discipline and self-denial. A pure silver performative object like nothing I've ever seen before. So in sum, medieval brooches take their unique messaging from their association with the body. One wears these things. Many make reference to the body's place in the church and in the cosmos and offer self-care and protection with material and amuletic power. They both close the cloak and protect the soul. But in the case of the fuller brooch, this basic multifunctional status has been taken to another level. Just as Alfred distributed Estelle's or pointer, pointers along with his copies of the pastoral care, perhaps he also gave at least one bishop a brooch. <laughs> Um, chastening the recipient to beware and to protect the door, the windows, the portals to the soul and to the portals to the church. Or maybe he kept it for himself, urging himself to polish the shield, to make it without spot through both physical rubbing and through diligent prayer, to be vigilant, to discipline his own senses and body in order to be worthy to discipline the other bodies in his care for the sake of the church and the English realm. Thank you.